Hi there folks, Tom here from Full Install. Uh, it's been a good while since I've made a video, one at least that wasn't a graphics card benchmark to keep my channel active. And that's mainly down to the fact that I've been a tad too busy. I recently started a new job, it's been Christmas, the Steam sale happened, too many things to play and no time to complete them all. But I'm much more settled down now so it's back to video making and what better topic to start up again with than one that's very close to my childhood. By virtue of the fact you have clicked this video, you have probably owned an Acorn Archimedes yourself at some point, or, by contrast, have absolutely no idea what it is. I'm not going to go into detail about all the different types of models of Acorn there were, mainly because I don't know or really care, but the one I got for Christmas was the Acorn A3010, and for the time this was a serious piece of kit to own. It probably doesn't look much by today's standards, but those green F keys will forever be imprinted in my brain. The Acorn was somewhat of a rival to the much more popular Amiga, and I look back on it in comparison to how the Sega Saturn stood up against the PlayStation. Both have a similar problem of being an interesting system with lots of potential, but lacking in third party support and overall public interest. But like the Saturn, amongst all those less than average releases lied the diamonds in the rough which gave me some of my most fondest gaming memories. And there are two in particular that I have wanted to talk about for a long time but simply haven't had the means to record the footage. However, after an annoyingly long amount of time trying, I have managed to get some of these titles running on somewhat of a serviceable emulator, so I thought for all the games I could get working, I would do a sort of short review and give a little insight to the type of software the Acorn had to offer. I'm going to start with the two aforementioned games I remember so fondly, so these reviews will be quite longer than the rest. The first game on my list is Bug Hunter, an incredibly simple game made difficult by puzzle structured level layouts. You play as the titled Bug Hunter, a Pez Dispenser looking character I always assume to be a robot who can walk up walls, jump and pick up items. Each level in the game takes place around an everyday house and your aim is to dispose of whatever critters are roaming around before making your way to the exit. Each level will have a certain item or items that you can pick up to aid you in squashing your enemies. These can only be picked up one at a time and your character can't jump whilst carrying them. If you come into contact with an enemy it's a one hit kill and some items you pick up will break upon impact forcing you to hit the suicide key to dispose of one of your free lives. It isn't too groundbreaking by any means, but for the time it really captured my imagination. This was a time when seeing a room of a house represented in such a way that seemed to scale with personal details was a big deal. And having grown up from a toddler watching movies like The Terminator and Conan the Barbarian, when I saw this poster in the background my mind nearly exploded. It is these little touches that have always made British gaming experiences a joy. Small little jokes no matter how insignificant they are just to put a smile on your face. As the levels go on, the enemies increase along with the difficulty in the way that they must be disposed of. Most items are dropped, but soon enough you'll come into contact with helium balloons which float upwards, giving new means of attack to insects that descend from above, and your success is dictated by your level of timing. It's a classic trial by error game, and one that I think will be perfectly suited to the current handheld market. Next up we have Starfighter 3000 and I have to say this game still impresses me for the same reasons it did back then. Let's pretend for a second that it isn't 2015 and that most every game released isn't a soulless mixture of every genre shut out into existence. Let's instead imagine that it's 1994, 3D rendering is still really far in the ether in terms of gaming and we've only seen glimpses of it with the flight simulator sections on the Krypton Factor. Then out of nowhere we have a game that is not only in full 3D, albeit coloured polygons, but one that has a draw distance of terrain as far as it does. Compare this to those horrible early 3D titles where you have about 3 foot of 3D space before you hit Fog of War. I'm looking at you Armarines. I completely understand that there isn't exactly a lot on screen to overwhelm you by today's standards, but to see a game that appeared to have an unlimited world to explore with actual structures, landmarks, destructible buildings and persistent decals, this is a release that is seriously ahead of its time. Onto the game itself, it's a third person flight simulator game and boy is it a hard one. Each mission starts and you're presented with an overview map of locations and a store where you can buy upgrades for your ship and you'll be needing to do this first and foremost as without shields and laser boosts you're going to have a pretty short gaming experience. Now the first big problem with Starfighter is the controls. It seemed the standard for the Acorn to not use the arrow keys or WASD keys for directing your character. Instead the default mapping had you using the Z and X key for left and right and the forward slash and apostrophe for up and down. For most games this isn't too much of a problem as there is usually only one primary button mapped to the space bar. However this time around the programmers felt the need to map the fire button to the enter key. Which just have a look at your keyboard for a second it makes for quite a bit of getting used to. Along with firing you can use your thrusters to go faster by use of the space bar and you can select up to 4 weapons using the F keys. Flying around and shooting things in this game never ceases to be fun to me and the way the structures explode in a barrage of polygons, just fantastic. 
And in the later levels, you encounter different environments, such as cities, which occasionally have to fly through tight gaps, which can prove really difficult with the controls, and space, which complete with asteroid belts, makes for a really immersive experience. There were actually further releases of Starfighter 3000, one on the PC which I've never been able to find, a copy of the 3DO which I've never owned, and a PlayStation and Sega Saturn version, although I have the Sega Saturn version which disappointingly isn't up to scratch. The frame rate is nowhere near as high, they've added music which really sucks, and the graphics are all muddy and now there is a limited fog of war. If you do ever get the chance to play the Acorn version, hats off to you firstly for being able to find either the system or the game, and secondly make sure you do, because it's a really fun relic of gaming history. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a few of the other titles I remember so fondly to run on the Acorn emulator, but these games included Flashback, Chuck Rock, Cannon Fodder and Heimdall, which have all seen popularity in other versions, so let's move on to the more realms of the unknown. Jet Fighter is a simple Atari inspired game controlled entirely by the mouse. You play as a spaceman, one mouse button boosts your jetpack and the other fires your gun. And that's pretty much the entire game. You fly up and down trying to shoot various weird shapes that they send from above, whilst trying to avoid contact with them in fear of an insta kill. It's really easy to understand and pick up and play. Nothing new by any stretch of the imagination, but fun nevertheless. Next up we have Mr. Do. This is a clone of so many games you have seen before and it's not too much of an interesting rendition to say the least. You play as Mr. Do, who appears to be a wizard of sorts, who loves cherries but hates fire. Each level consists of nothing more but blocks and enemies to avoid. Collect all the blocks with the cherries on whilst avoiding the flames and you're on to the next level. It's that simple. It gets boring pretty quick and the music here is quite soul destroying so if you do intend to play I recommend turning that off in the menu before you go anywhere near the start button. Dinosaur is a promotional demo and this game doesn't mind telling you that right off the bat. You play as a caveman, a cool caveman with shades and a chainsaw, and he's going around carving himself up some dinosaurs. This is a weird specimen of a game, it reminds me of one of those early flash releases that would pop up on Newgrounds. The game itself isn't particularly fun to play, the controls are a bit off and the sight of blood just seems like a bit of a gimmick, but hey it does have music and that was something of a rarity at the time. A Maze this game I couldn't fully figure out, but damn I liked it. From what I gather, you play against the AI and both of you have to nominate a row on the grid to slide from side to side in order to place the next queued up piece. Moving pieces connects the path and I think your circle moves along the path automatically. The logic here being that you would try to set up your opponent with a bogus path. I need to go back and figure out exactly how this one is played, but I like it nevertheless. Moonquake. It's bummer man. Less pretty, more zoomed out, less interesting Bomberman. Not much more else to say about it other than that I like the explosion sound effect. Pac-Mania. This is a game a lot of us will have played in its various releases. I first played this on the Sega Mega Drive and this version doesn't stray too far away from its counterpart. It's isometric Pac-Man. Only now there is jumping and music. The music here is pretty catchy, however the emulation doesn't really do it justice. But the visuals and animation here clearly make it one of the better releases. A solid entry in the Acorns library. Next we have Repton Free. There were Repton games before it. In fact, this is a remake of a previous system and it really could have done with a bit of polish. The music is pretty awful, the visuals haven't translated well from the limitations of the previous systems, and it's just really boring. You can give this one a miss. Ah, Speedball. Anyone who owned an Amiga back in the day will have fond memories of this one. Still one of the best two-player sports games you can get to date, Speedball has you hurling around a ball of steel and slide tackling your enemies in a futuristic setting that really hasn't got boring in two decades. A must for any retro gamer, just avoid the horrible HD remake. Hold on to your socks because here's all in boxing! That's enough for that. 
Next up, we have 3D Tank. This one is very primitive 3D, as everything here is a wireframe. Your aim of each level is to find the enemy tanks displayed on the map by the red dot, destroy them and progress to the next level. Each new level is host to greater amounts of tanks and in turn heightened difficulty. It can be a little confusing at first, as it can prove quite hard to differentiate obstacles from one another, but after a while you seem to ease into it and actually it can be quite fun. The only drawback is that it uses the same default mapping keys as Starfighter, which can be a little tricky, but still, worth your time if you get the chance. Here is Alien Invasion. It's little more than a Space Invaders clone. It has nice colourful graphics and backdrops, but otherwise it's pretty much unchanged. You can't go wrong, really. Bobby Blockhead versus the Dark Planet. This is a Super Pitfall-inspired platformer, which, like many of the early titles, chose to have music over sound effects. Your aim here is to collect these yellow shapes, avoid traps, and get to the next level. It's average at best, and I can't help but think the designers just sliced the character model's hair clean across to fit in with the corridors. Not awful, but awfully charmless. White Mage is a gauntlet clone, and one that is not great, unfortunately. The character and the enemy models seem to have been pulled and reinterpreted from the arcade classic Clones of games were not too uncommon back in the day, similar to the way now you have a really cheap B-movie version of a blockbuster, Apocalypse Z for example. Sometimes you can get away with an imitation, but Gauntlet had a very precise execution, which this one really doesn't have. Next we have Gorn, which to my surprise was a text adventure. I'm a huge fan of text adventures, and being able to play this in the old Risco operating system with that glorious font gave me a big burst of nostalgia, which I have to say kept me playing a lot longer than I had expected to. It's hard to review a text adventure without simply telling the story, so I'll end this one by just letting you know that the game told me off, suggesting that I urinate on a monument. Here we have Oddball, and this is a game I'd completely forgotten about, and one I'm glad I stumbled across. This is similar to Breakout, but with a bit of a twist. You still control a platform that is used to bounce a ball in the direction of blocks, only now the platform can move 360 degrees, and the camera is centralised and zoomed in as you move around. Your objectives remain the same as Breakout, you have to guide the ball to all the blocks to complete the level, but these levels are big maze-like structures, they remind me of the bonus stage in Sonic the Hedgehog. It can prove really easy to lose your ball due to the limited amount of viewing space you have on the screen, but luckily if your map doesn't steer you in the right direction, you have a pointer that guides you if your ball is far away. This is a really fun game, and I'm glad to say I played it for quite some time. It also has a really fantastic soundtrack which never gets annoying or repetitive. Bollocks, I mean, uh, blocks. Here we have a Tetris clone, and a perfectly serviceable one. It's missing music, but in its place we have some very low rendered backgrounds, and what the hell is that? Time Zone. This is a flight sim that really took me a while to figure out, as the key configuration is a bit all over the place. After some button pressing, I found out that the number keys are dedicated to your speed levels, and I was able to take off and fly around. I never actually found a purpose to my aerial adventure, but there was something eerily soothing that kept me playing. The game doesn't have music, but does have this constant ambient sound that I assume is meant to be representative of the plane's engine, and alongside with the sprawling polygon setting, I became somewhat hypnotised as I flew around. Okay, we've all played Trivial Pursuit, and we don't need to play this version. There is nothing wrong with playing a board game on a computer. Look at chess, for example, it's always been massively popular, but this has one fatal flaw which prevents it from being interesting, and that is how the questions are answered. You would expect for a computer which has a keyboard bolted to the front of it, you would be able to type in your answer. Even Family Fortunes on the NES had that. Instead, no, it simply gives you a question, you're expected to say it out loud in the room, and then the game asks you if you got it correct or not. Rubbish. Next up we have Enigma. This is a mix and match the icons game, a somewhat half breed of Tetris and Mahjong, where you must slide pattern shapes left or right to meet their pair in order for them to disappear off the screen. 
Your shape's movement is dictated by gravity, so if they meet a ledge they will fall, and your choices must have logic behind them if you don't wish to become unstuck. I had a lot of fun with this game. As it progresses, levels get more complicated, making you consider your moves many steps in advance, as you may have multiple symbols, all of which need to be met at the same time. There are also moving obstacles in your way, which act as elevating platforms. However, I had the emulation set way too fast, so these became somewhat bothersome, but not too problematic to stop me from playing. A real gem for the Acorns library. Pipe Mania. Look familiar? That's right, it's the pipe hacking mechanic from Bioshock. The main difference here being that rather than attempting to get your water to a predetermined piece, we are instead trying to outrun the clock, extending the pipe so that the water never runs back into itself. This is an addictive one, and one I wish I had back in the 90s as I'm sure it would have given me hours of entertainment. E-Type. I'll be honest, I was hoping for a ripoff of R-Type here, but instead what we got is an imitation of another Master System classic, Outrun. This is a racing game, and not a terrible one at that. However, I can only think this game was made with a joystick in mind, as using the mouse to steer the car is a bit of a nightmare. Although I do put that down to poor mouse emulation from the software I am using, so I will disregard that as a flaw. The main issue I have with this game is that everything outside the road is a collision. Whether it be water or trees, there is no room for error. But then again, games were harder back then, and no one likes an easy game. Here's Iron Lord. This is easily one of the more impressive games I have played on the Acorn, but I'll be damned if I could figure out what to do. You play as a knight who, with the aid of his horse, can traverse a small land of key locations. When you do get to a town or village, your navigation switches to a tiny window in the corner of the screen which I found to be rather odd and pretty difficult to use. I never got much further than these sections, but looking at screenshots of how the combat works, I'm nearly 90% sure I had this game, so it is a game I will be looking to go back and revisit, but more than likely on DOS. Superior this is a golfing game, and a pretty much on par golfing game with anything from the 16-bit era. This has some slight 3D working in the background with the placing of the trees, however I don't like how your main character looks. He reminds me of one of those handheld racing games where the car is just drawn on the plastic and everything else moves around it. But as a golfing game it works, and I liked how colourful it was. Ixion next, and no, not the electric pony from Final Fantasy X. This is a cyberpunk FPS. Everything as you would expect is a polygon, and strangely your character moves similar to Eye of the Beholder by clicking on a directional button rather than using the keys. It's really easy to die, and aiming seems to be a little off-centre, but I love anything cyberpunk, no matter how primitive, so I'd like to go back to this one. What's this top banana? Well, this looks like a nice game. Yeah, this is a bit fucked up. Swiftly moving on, we have Fireball 2. I had this back in the day and it was awesome. Again, another breakout clone, but with brilliant music. Unfortunately, the emulation doesn't render the graphics properly, so I'll cut this one a bit short. This is Rick Dangerous. This is only a demo of the game, and as such, it's in black and white. But that's okay, we can just pretend it's film noir. This is an Indiana Jones inspired platformer, your main aim as with most games of the genre is to collect items, avoid enemies and navigate to the exit. It controls well and when you die Rick lets out a comical scream. I'd really like to play a non demo version of this just to see what it looks like in colour. Pop 
Populous. Some games need no introduction. An all time classic by Bullfrog released on nearly anything you could plug a screen into. And I am still as bewildered today as I was 20 years ago of how to play the game. It's a masterpiece. Mad Professor Mariarty is certainly one of the Acorn games that feels more accomplished. If you're wondering what I mean by that, it is obvious from the footage previously that a lot of these games are just a mechanic on a screen, similar to a lot of the old Atari games. Emissions of things such as music or animation, story or graphics were commonplace, but this one feels like it was much more a labour of love. That's not to say that it's amazing, it's a simple 16-bit style platforming affair. You're a professor and your laboratory has gone haywire and with the help of an unlimited supply of wrenches, you must fight your way to the end of each stage. The environments are nice and colourful, the animation is well drawn and the music and sound effects are perfectly serviceable. Out of curiosity, I headed over to eBay to see how much this game goes for and the Amiga version goes for about £100, so if you're a collector you better get saving those pennies. And lastly, we have Super 8 Pool. This game left an unbelievable impression on me back in the 90s. A full 3D pool table with changeable camera angles and somewhat real physics. It was a wonder to behold at its time. You control the queue using the mouse, first need to get into position by controlling the back end of the camera which feels a bit strange. Then once you're all lined up, you pull back the mouse and strike forward for appropriate impact. There is something incredibly relaxing about this game. It's probably just nostalgia, but for me the lack of environment and music, just simple non-intrusive sound effects, it's just you and the table, bliss. So there you go, some of what the Acorn Archimedes had to offer. Thanks for watching, and if you have anything Acorn related you'd like to share, please do leave a comment. Because I can honestly say I've never met another person who has even heard of, let alone played one.